Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are so glad that you are joining us on this, a very special worship of the Lord on this, the second Sunday in May. We greet you and we say with a voice of love, with a voice of peace, and with the voice of excitement. Happy Mother's Day. We celebrate, affirm, and we also support the ministry of motherhood in the life of humanity. No matter who you are as a mother, whether you are a birth mother, a surrogate mother, a godmother, a stand-in mother, whatever you have been gifted motherhood by or through, we say to you on this day, Happy Mother's Day. A special Happy Mother's Day to my own mother, Maddie Rachel, Happy Mother's Day. So very thankful to have you as a mother and to all my godmothers, my wonderful aunts, and those who are adopted spiritual mothers and to those who just love. Thank you and Happy Mother's Day to you. Now, my brother and sister, I wanna pause and to invite you into a special place where God might bless you and where you might invite God into your room, your sanctuary on this very special day. I want to invite you to pray with me and to be the strength that God has called you to be for others at this time. I invite you into the room to pray, invoke, and allow God to speak. Let's pray together on this, the Lord's day. Gracious God, thank you as we come we present ourselves to you, we offer ourselves to you, we pause and invite you to have your way. In all that you're doing and all that you're going to do, we want you to have your way. We thank you and we bless your name. Through Christ who is Lord, speak. We, your servants, are listening and we are hearing you. Amen. Thank you very much for your willingness to invoke and invite the presence of God. On this day, we continue in our series. We continue in our spring series about a resurrection theology, the gospel according to Motown. And on this day, we pick up with a second edition in the series. And I invite you to come to the Old Testament with me, to the first book given to the name Samuel. So I want you to turn with me in 1 Samuel, in chapter 1, the verses are extremely long. We're going to hear some of those verses, but I want you to concentrate on verses 1 through 20. That's 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. Our reading today will be from the English translation of this, the Old Testament Hebrew text. Listen now to the English translation. Yours may be slightly different. Hear the word of the Lord. There was a certain man from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. He happened to be the son of Jeroham, who was a son of Elah, who was a son of Toha, who was a son of Zophah. They were all Ephraimites. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man used to go up every year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the sons of Eli, two of them, were the priests. On the day that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to her sons, all of them, and her daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord closed her womb and her rival, Peninnah, used to provoke her grievously 
to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, year after year, when they would go to the house of the Lord for worship, Peninnah would provoke Hannah. Therefore, Hannah would weep and would not eat. And Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed and wept bitterly to the Lord. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart and only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunk woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman in troubled spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all the days along I have been speaking out about great anxiety and vexation in my soul. Therefore, Eli said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their house at Raham. And Elkanah knew his wife Hannah intimately and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for your patience, and thank you for reading this very powerful passage of Scripture. We read verses 1 through 20 because it was necessary for us to get the context of the message that God has for us on this day. We come to our second installment family on their series, Resurrection Theology. Today, we are blessed with the theme or the subject for this, the Lord's Day, the tracks of my tears, the tracks of my tears. One of the most endearing, one of the most gut-wrenching, one of the most tell-tell signs of the Motown era was this particular song written by a fella named Smokey Robinson entitled The Tracks of My Tears. Smokey Robinson declares that he came to appreciate this particular song as he was writing it. Smokey declares that one day while he stared in a mirror, something came to him and he expressed that he wanted to write a song about tears that no one else had ever written before. Smokey wanted people to wrestle with, what do we do with the tears of our lives? What do we do when we have cried so many tears that there are tracks in our faces, almost like footprints in the sand? What do we do when the pain of hurt, the grief of loss, the struggle of separation has overwhelmed us and we have cried so much that tracks appear, but no one would know them. The song Tracks of My Tears 
was written by Smokey Robinson to address what people should do with the tears that no one really understands. My brothers and sisters, he wrote this, this particular passage and song, he wrote it to address my brothers and sisters, a former lover, a man who, or a woman, who had experienced heartache and heartbreak, who had loved so deeply and so hard that when the romance was over, when the separation had come, they were not sure how they should approach life. They were known to be the life of parties, but deep down inside, the party was not exactly what they really felt like. This song, Tracks of My Tears, was written to talk about the pain and suffering that any individual who has loved somebody, who has experienced a great loss, who grief has overwhelmed, this song was written to articulate how you smile in public, but down on the inside and in private, you've got tears so deep and you cried so long that if you look closely, you can see tracks of the tears in your eyes. Beloved, this powerful Motown hit has a way of reaching us and talking to us and expressing to us a resurrection theology. My brothers and sisters, I want you to hear the words. Maybe some of you are too, long, too young to know these words, but I want you to understand the power that exists in words like these. Listen to the lyrics, the first verse, as they appear on the screen. Not only listen, but also look at these powerful lyrics. People say, I'm the life of the party, cause I can tell a joke or two. Although I might be laughing loud and heartily, deep inside I'm blue. So take a good look at my face. You'll see a smile looks out of place. If you just look closer, it's easy to trace the tracks of my tears. Smokey says, I need you, need you since you left me. If you see me with another girl, see me that I'm having fun. Although she may be cute, she's just a substitute because you're the permanent one. Beloved brothers and sisters, I want you to understand just what Smokey's lyrics are articulating. That there are times in life where we may seem to everyone else as if we are the life of the party. Where it may seem that we have it all together. But down on the inside, we are struggling. We are hurting so deeply that if people really paid attention to us and looked deep within our face, they would see not tears of joy, but they would see tracks of tears of pain and sorrow. Beloved, this kind of experience is exactly what we find in the amazing story of Elkanah, Hannah, and Peninnah. And today I've just got to share with you the tracks of the tears of Hannah, the tracks of the tears of Peninnah, the tracks of the tears that Elkanah has shared in this biblical narrative on this special day. Beloved, there is something in motherhood that speaks to the tracks of tears throughout life. Any mother in the house today knows that sometimes if your children looked at your face and see that the smile was just out of place. They could, if they paid attention, they could see the tracks of your tears, how you had cried sometimes, how you had given up what you knew was right for you so that they might have better. My brothers and sisters, the tracks of a mother's tears are powerful. The tracks of a father's tears are indescribable. And today God calls our attention to the biblical narrative to testify that the tracks of our tears have a sermon for us. Beloved, in the Old Testament, in the historical section, God pulls us to the book of 1 Samuel and he shares descriptively a powerful narrative where the tracks of our tears may be manifested. There's a man named Elkanah and we've heard that he's a good man. It's obvious he's wealthy. He's wealthy because he has two wives. My brothers and sisters, let me pause and bring into color for you. He has two wives only because he can afford it. He has two wives not to mistreat one and take care of the other, but to treat both of them equally. And you'll discover the one he loves, he attempts to treat even better. 
My brothers and sisters, Elkanah is a good man. He's from the tribe of the Ephraim crowd. Do you do know that the Ephraimites are connected to those who are Levites? They are special people, priestly people, holy people. So he has a generation, at least five. His family is connected to the holy family. In essence, I'm attempting to say that he's just not a good man because he has money. And let me pause and say in the society in which we live, we have relegated goodness and the name good man or woman to what you have or because you have. I know plenty of people who don't have a lot, but they are good. I know plenty of people who don't have much, but their character and integrity is so solid that they are even more uniquely gifted by God's grace than those who have a plethora of degrees, a plethora of money, and a plethora of privilege. I don't want you to live your life believing from this day forward that goodness is attached to money, good credit, and wealth. My brother and sister, some of the greatest people you will ever meet may never have the kind of credit that you have, may never have the kind of potential in wealth building and privilege that you do. My brother and sister, Elkanah is a good man because of his character and the connection he has to the holiness of God. Some of us need to understand that goodness Good men may be good, not because of the money they make, but because they have a relationship with God and God supplies all of their needs according to God's riches and not theirs. I'm sorry, I just wanna make it clear that Elkanah is a good man, not because he has money to afford two families, but because he's connected to the man and the woman of God through the line of the Levites. There's something special about those of us who have relationship with God in the household of faith. Beloved, I want you to know that he's a good man. And it says that he's a good man and here's how we know it. Because every year he goes up to Shiloh to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to know that the Ephraimites, who he is a part of, his family lineage, the five generations before him, lived in the northern area. And sometimes lineage and genealogy may not be exciting to you. I understand that. And when you hear names that you can't pronounce, you may be turned off by the biblical narrative. But I want you to know that when you hear the names and the tribes of people in biblical text, they are connecting that individual to something greater than them. I want you to understand it's important when you see the names of biblical characters listed that you recognize that the writers or writer is attempting to connect that character to something greater than themselves. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm trying to say that every now and then, beloved, we need to know that we aren't great because of what we do. But there have been people who for years have been praying that your manifestation would be what it is. I want to share this with you, that every individual looking and listening now, you are the answer to somebody who is an ancestor now prayer. We are the answers to our ancestors prayers. Those who didn't have a chance to go where you're going. Those who haven't had a chance to live through what you have lived through. They prayed for you and you are the manifestation of their prayers. You are their answered prayers. And I don't know about you, but that changes my prayer tune. I want to pray for the children that I have. I want to pray for the grandchildren and the great grandchildren that I have. I want to pray family and I want you to pray that those who are yet born in your family line will be blessed with opportunity and greatness that you may never physically see, but you will see in the spirit realm. He is who he is because he's connected to people who prayed for him and he has what he has because he's connected to a line of greatness. We are all connected. And if you say, I don't have a history like that, then that means you are the start 
of the history. You are the start. You are the beginning of a lineage and a legacy that will be greater than those who've gone on before you. Oh, we praise God right now that even now we have a chance to start new legacies and new opportunities. I'm preaching. You just don't know it. The text says that he's a good man from the northern hemisphere area and he would leave and go further north every year at a particular time to worship and sacrifice to the Lord. He got good sins. He knows that he didn't do it all by himself. And I want to serve notice every year, every week, you ought to come and worship the Lord every week. You ought to throw your head back and say, if it had not been for the Lord on my side every week, you ought to be willing to give God what God deserves. That's your praise, your adoration, and your thanksgiving. You may not feel like it every week. It may not look like God is blessing you, but God deserves your praise and your adoration. God deserves it because God's been good to you. He woke you up. He started you out. He's brought you over things you've seen and through things you have not seen. It's God's grace that brought you through the tracks of your tears. The text says, beloved, that he goes every year to worship. And while he's there, he sacrifices on behalf of his family. I gotta pause and say to you, brother and sister, that every now and then, you ought to worship God and make sacrifices to God on behalf of your family. You ought to do that not just on your behalf, but on behalf of those who are depending on you. You know, we have to pray a certain way. We have to pray God's provision because there are people who are depending on you. And if you don't pray and ask God to do it, it shall not be done. There are people depending on you to pray. God needs you to pray. Elkanah understood. He'd offer praise. He'd offer adoration. And he'd offer sacrifices on behalf of those who needed his support. Oh, my brother and sister, he'd offer it. And year by year, he'd offer on behalf of his family. The text says that not only does he offer on behalf of his family, but we are introduced to the reality that he has two wives, Panetta and Hannah. Now, I want to be specific and break this down, beloved. Hannah and Elkanah were married first. And Jewish historians and scholars have been able to articulate, this is for you, that they were married 10 years and Hannah had not had any children, particularly a son. Beloved, I need you to understand that he is forced by the cultural dynamic of his day to take a second wife to produce children. This resembles a bit of historical significance in the lives of biblical characters years before. You do remember Sarah and Abraham. They couldn't have children so far. And so Sarah goes and gets someone that we know as an African queen, Hagar, and brings her into their life to assist God and help God. Penina is brought into the life of Elkanah and Hannah to assist because for 10 years, Hannah being married could not produce any children. Now this is significant because the value and get this, the legacy and the posterity of Hannah was tied to her ability to produce a son. You see, her legacy wasn't just tied to the fact she was married to Elkanah, it would be tied to the fact that she had a son for him. My brother and sister, you may not like it, but you need to understand the context that Hannah and Panina are working in. The text says that Hannah becomes a wife and then Panina becomes a wife. And the word says that Panina is able to have children for Elkanah and Hannah could not. Now, some women and some men would say, we don't know if Elkanah was the problem or if Hannah was the problem. Well, I think we do. The text says that God had closed the womb. He made Hannah barren. But we, we pushed this envelope. I was reading this in research and I want to share it with you. I want to cover all bases today. 
I want you to know that some said, well, we don't know if Elkanah couldn't produce. So it might have been Elkanah who had the real issue and not Hannah. That's a lie. Let me tell you how we know, because he's married a second time to Peninnah. And what does Peninnah produce? Children, specifically men and girls. So Elkanah is not the problem. And the biblical text highlights that by saying that God has closed the womb of Hannah. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to get out in those ideologies and those, let me just say it this way, theologies that are produced by personalities who are attempting to disregard the work of God in texts that make people now in the 21st century uncomfortable. We don't have to agree with everything that God is doing and allows in this lifetime. We just have to agree that God has the power to change it. And that's a word for you and for me, that right now we don't have to agree with where God has us. We don't have to agree with what God is allowing in our life. We don't have to agree with how God has allowed us to suffer and to go through and to be told no and to have barrenness in this season or in this lifetime. But we do have to recognize that God has the power to change our trajectory at any moment. And that's what makes Hannah so powerful. She believed that God has the power at any given moment, in any season, to change the trajectory of her life. And I don't know about you, but that's a word for me. That I never lose hope that God, no matter what my circumstances are, is able at any moment to change the trajectory of my life. Is there anybody here who would testify that right now you are nowhere near where you want to be. You are not working where you desire to work. You are feeling that you are in a dead end. But I've come to announce to you, never lose hope that God's power is able to change that thing. God can do a 180, not a 360, because that means you're back where you started. But God will do a 180 and change the trajectory of your life. Preach, Pastor. I think I will. Hannah believes that about God and you will see that through the tracks of her tears. Beloved, the word says that Peninnah provokes Hannah. I, I want to make it live. It says that when they would go up to worship every year, that he would give Elkanah a good man, a good husband, would give his family portions as he sacrificed. He would give Peninnah a portion. He would give Peninnah's children a portion. And the word says that he gave Hannah a double portion. Why would the writer insist at this moment to talk about the double portion that Elkanah would give Hannah? You know why? Because the writers of the text are attempting to show you and I where his loyalty and his authentic love lies. Beloved, he takes Peninnah because he needs children, but he loves Hannah. Hannah is his heart. And why, pastor, are you bringing up the idea that he loves Hannah, but he has two wives? You know why? Because Peninnah and her aggression and her, watch this, you know, her being an antagonist to Hannah is because Peninnah is living in the chateaus of Hannah, his true love. Oh, preach pastor, I think I will. I'm having fun exegeting. I'm having fun giving the context. Listen, Peninnah is in the shadow of the love of his life. So Peninnah has tracks of tears. So Panina is heartbroken because she is not the apple of her husband's eye. Watch this. And she's given him what Hannah could not. Let me pause and invite you to join the narrative. Have you ever been the second choice? Have you ever stepped into a role that someone else could not perform and do and you produced what was necessary and needed? And guess what? They still looked over you and went back to the one that couldn't produce? Help me, Holy Spirit. I know there's some folk listening and looking today that know what it's like to do what is required of you to be better. She didn't do it once. The word says she had sons with an S and daughters with an S. She didn't produce just one of each. 
She produced multiple. I discovered she produced, watch this, 10 children. That is why when Elkanah says to Hannah, am I not better than 10 sons? It is represent, he is selling, he is saying to Hannah, I love you more than I do the 10 children I have with Panina. Panina's aggressive attitude and her hate, as we would call it, toward Hannah is based in she's in the shadows of Hannah. So let me pause and give you a real shout moment. There are people in our lives that are hating on us because whether they realize it, well, they do, you don't. They are in your shadow. Woo. Let me stop because some of y'all missed y'all moment to be relieved of the question why. Some people are hating on you because they are in your shadows in their own mind. There is nothing worse than being insecure and feeling that no matter how hard you work at something, you will never be sufficient as someone else. Oh, preach pastor, I think I will. Hannah is experiencing hate and experiencing tears because Panina's tears are a result of her feeling that she is in the chateau of Hannah. Preacher, how do you know it? Because of the research that the Jewish scholarship has revealed and I've studied. Panina and the rabbis, I went asked rabbis this. Panina is jealous of Hannah because Elkanah loves her more. And we know it to be biblically true because he gives Hannah a double portion when he gives the rest of them one portion. Oh, my brother and sister, how should you? How should I, how should the human family respond to hate? We got to first recognize that some people are being antagonist in our life because they feel that they are in our shadows. That's why you can go to work tomorrow. You can go to work whenever and you can recognize that some folk hating on you because they are really feeling they're in your shadow. Even laugh about it, that someone would think that they can't outshadow you. Oh, preach, Pastor. I think I will. Panetta is pushing the narrative she's pushing because she's in the shadow. And get this, she wants the attention that Elkanah is giving to Hannah. Now, I share that because some of us are Panetta's. Some of us are in the shadows of others. And we're treating people in low down, treacherous ways because we are really feeling that we are standing in their shadow. And I've come to tell you, God has blessed you, whether you were the second or whether you were the last. God's blessed you and God's gifted you with what the situation calls for. Oh, preach pastor, every now and then we don't have to be the first in order for God to bless us. Every now and then we don't have to be the people's choice in order to be God's choice. Everybody biblically was not the choice of the culture, but they were the choice of an almighty God. And if you're the choice of God, I come to tell you, I'd rather be God's choice than the people's choice. Because when I'm God's choice, somehow, some way, I'll always rise to the level of excellency. And so will you. Preach, Pastor. Beloved, Hannah is the choice of Elkanah and Panina produces what Elkanah needs so she has value and worth in the family. Everybody's got value and there's no need to put down anybody because you feel you're in their shadow. My brother and sister, the text says that she did it every year to irritate her every year, not once, every year. The Jewish rabbis that I spoke with even said that there are legends that suggest that have become traditions that suggest that Panina would go so far as to tap Hannah on her shoulder every day and say, are you not going to prepare a meal for your children when they come home from school? Are you not preparing? Oh, you don't have any children. Oh, are you not tucking children in bed? That was mean and treacherous and low down. But those are the tra traditions that in truth, Jewish rabbis have said actually took place in the life of Hannah. 
Why would I tell you that? Because I need you to know the tracks of her tears. I need you to know the pain and the anguish that Hannah went through. But I also need you to recognize that if you're doing someone like that, the pain and the agony that Peninnah is also going through because she cannot take Hannah's place. Let me tell you something again. Hurt people hurt people. When people are carrying hurt and bitterness, it is because they have been hurt and have bitterness in them and they cannot give what they don't have. Beloved, one of the most dangerous things we have to be aware of is that when we are requesting something from people that, that, that they do not have because they don't have, they have been hurt and are hemmed in and hung up in their hurt. Today, God is saying to you, be free. Embrace Jesus Christ as a resurrected savior and be free. Be free from the hurt and the hangups that are hindering you from giving your whole self to someone who is trying to love you. Preach pastor. Text says every year they would have that issue. And God had closed up Hannah's womb. Let me rush. Let me cut across the field because this is good, but I need to get to a certain point. I, I may have to do a tracks of my tears part two. Beloved, look. It says that he that 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 Peninnah would do this to irritate Hannah. And as she would do it, Hannah on one year, on this particular year, Hannah had had enough. Hannah had been like Fannie Lou Hamer and become sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she had had enough. Now, wait, she's not a 21st century woman. You know, 21st century women, when they have enough, they put their hands on the hips and they're going to roll their neck and they're going to give you every piece of their imagination and mind. And they're going to tell you off. They're going to bless you in a way that curses you. Hannah is not that kind of woman. And beloved, maybe we need some Hannah's in our culture now who can hear the hurt of others and rather than respond with hurt, Hannah responds in the way that every Christian woman, every religious woman of God should respond. She responds by going to the household of the Lord and dropping on her knees and pouring her heart out to the God she believes can make the difference. Every now and then, the tracks of our tears ought to force us into the cradle of the arms of the Lord to pray unto God. Motherhood isn't always about responding with our mouth. Sometimes it's responding with the most powerful weapon we have, and that is to take our burdens to the Lord in prayer. The gift of motherhood is to have an extraordinary prayer life. And for every mother, I want to encourage you today to develop your prayer life, to have a life of prayer that God and you can have relationship in such a way that hell and burdens force you to God and not to retaliate. Text says on this year, she went to God in the temple and prayed. And she prayed in such a way that she caught the attention of the priest. Woo! And it wasn't because she fell and bellowed a word out loud. Loudness does not get the attention that you need. Being loud, obnoxious, and overwhelming does not always mean it's the right thing to do. Sometimes motherhood is about taking your burdens to God in a way that only you and God can work some stuff out. Beloved, she goes to God and her prayers from the inside are so moving and monumental that get this, the priest, the elder priest, Eli, notices her. When have you ever prayed and lived a life of prayer in such a way that the pastor would notice you and the prayers that you're praying, not your hands lifted, 
not your shout and dance, not you clapping, but the fact that you are noticed by how you pray, by the demonstration of your faith in prayer. Beloved, we ought to have a prayer life that is noticed by the men and women of God because of how we're praying. Hannah prays, and I do need to interrupt this moment and share with you that Hannah breaks the barriers just to talk to God. You do know that at this period of time that women were not allowed to worship in that sanctuary that men were. You do know that she had to break some traditional and cultural boundary laws to get to where she could interrupt the temple's practices and pray. I want to say to you that every now and then motherhood encompasses breaking traditional barriers and boundaries so that, watch this, not you can get what you want, but so that you can talk to God and let God work on your behalf. Sometimes you got to go where you've never gone before in order to have what you never had. Sometimes you got to talk with God in ways and spaces. You got to make holy ways and spaces that you've never done before. And, and Hannah is willing to do that. And I got to ask a question. Are you so tired of the tears that you have shed and are ready to talk to God in a way that will draw the attention of your God? Hold on. I, I need to pause right there before we get any further. And I need to let you sink and allow that to sink in in your life. How do you talk to God? Beloved, when you think about it, when you think about Hannah breaking boundaries and breaking traditions, the word says she cried and wept bitterly to God. She said, listen, I'm weeping. I'm crying to God. She, she's, tr she's singing the tracks of my tears spiritually. She loves that man and she loves him and she wants to what? Have a child. But the tr look, she's been, watch this, holding a household together. She's been fixing food. She's been going year after year to worship. She had a smile on her face. But if you know the truth, she's saying what Smokey says, if the smile is out of place. Every now and then when Hannah had to look at, at Penina and her children and Elkanah interacting with them, the smile that she had was out of place because her children were not yet born. Beloved, she's got tracks. She's got tracks of tears. And sometimes we have tracks of tears in our life when we've had to watch the dreams and the hopes that we have had for our life manifest in the lives of those who are around us. Some spouses had to celebrate and affirm their spouse as they have achieved what they wanted to achieve for themselves. I wanna pause and tell you, don't be, yeah, honey, I know. But you look at how Hannah handles it. You look at the gift of motherhood that Hannah will be blessed by because of how she handles, watch this, the success and the satisfaction of Penina and her children. You got to learn how to live in the success of people who have what you want and desire, but you hadn't got it yet. That's some of what's wrong with America and the world. We don't know how to live in the success of others. We allow, we let the Penina spirit get us and become bitter and vexed because someone has what we really want. Hannah doesn't retaliate that way. She turns to the Lord. And I'm telling you today, you need to turn to the Lord when the manifestation of your dreams are in someone else's driveway. So take a good look at the smile on my face and just know it's hiding the tracks of my tears. Beloved, she goes to God, she weeps to God uncontrollably. She, watch this, she talks to God because she believes that God has the power to change the trajectory of her life. And she believes that the man of God 
That's why she says, find favor with your servant to Eli. She believes in the power of Eli's prayer life, just like she believes in the power of God. I don't know about you, but prayers sometimes are answered because we believe in the ones who are praying for us. I want you to know that there is power in people praying for you who, who you believe in their prayer life. Four friends brought a man on a mat and Jesus healed that man because of their life, their faith. Beloved, make sure you are surrounded by not just people who will co-sign because that's what you love. You like co-signers to, to co-sign all your mess. No, no, you need some friends who will tell you the truth about your trifling self and tell you we're going to pray you through what you're going through. Let me ask a question. Do you believe in the prayer life of the people that are surrounding you? Do you believe your, pray, your friends can get a prayer through for you? I, I, I believe in the prayer life of my friends. And you ought to believe in the prayer life of someone that you're connected to. Now, let me move on. Text says, I, I need to close this down. You know what? I'm going to shut this down and I'll come back and finish the tracks of my tears part two next week because this is really good. And I've been going on long enough. What, what word is this for Hannah? What word is this for you in motherhood? Beloved, believe me, you don't respond to the hate and the bitterness of others with bitterness. You respond with where I'm leaving you today. Hannah goes to the Lord and weeps and talks to God for herself. There is absolutely nothing like a mother who prays for her children. There is absolutely nothing like a woman who can talk to the Lord on behalf of the need and the desire that she has. Beloved, I'm shutting it down with the tracks of my tears part one by letting you know that you have to trust God with your prayers. You've got to trust God with the bitterness and the unfortunate circumstances that befold in your life. I want to shut it down and I want you to know that without a shadow of a doubt, we will be back next week, the Lord willing to finish this powerful, the tracks of my tears sermon moment. I thank God, though, for what God has revealed to me and to you in this moment. I want you to know that when the burdens of life are so heavy on you and me, that we don't have to respond to the paninas in our life going tit for tat. We don't have to respond to people who are bitter and envious and jealous because of their feeling that they're in our shadows. We can take those very problems to the Lord. Hannah takes the issues to God, breaks tradition and boundaries and weeps unto God. My word for you is to take it all to the Lord in prayer and watch God resurrect what seemingly is dead in your life. May the Lord bless you on this day. Happy Mother's Day again to every mother who has children biologically or surrogately. Happy Mother's Day to those of you who have stood in the stead for a mother at any moment. And let me say again, Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that love me and have loved me through my inconsistency. And let me say a special Happy Mother's Day to Deanne. And let me say a special Happy Mother's Day to Mama Jean. Thank you so very much for who you are in our lives. And we thank you, every mother, for who you are in the life of those who you love. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. It's my prayer and it is my hope that you can manifest the Hannah spirit in your life this week. Be encouraged.